My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined by a fantastic individual. This man knew how to work hard on the pitch, and he brought a lot of joy to us Aussies who waited a very, very long time to make a World Cup. None other than the great John Aloisi. John, welcome. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, we're going to go all the way back. John, how did you fall in love with our great game? It was pretty easy because uh, I had an older brother, as you know, Ross, uh, three years older than me, and um, and my dad. My dad, he, he loved sport in general. He played a lot of cricket, uh, funny enough, even from his Italian uh, heritage. He, he arrived in Australia at nine years old, but to, to integrate with the community, he ended up playing cricket in the summer. Um, but he didn't play Aussie rules. He played soccer, He uh, football. He, he loved it and... Um, you know, he fell in love with a club um, that's still around now. It was called Adelaide Juventus back then. Um, and then uh, later on, Adelaide City. Um, and so, you know, I was just born with, uh, you know, sport in the family. Sport uh, was always on in our household, um, no matter what sport. Uh, and then, you know, football was one of them. And uh, he used to play all the time in, in the backyard with my brother and, you know, ever since I can remember, I think I was probably, you know, two, three years old and I was kicking the ball around. And then, um, but started playing with a, a club down in Adelaide called Ingle Farm at five years old. They were the only ones back then that would accept a, a, a young <laughs> player like that. So I played there for two years, then moved on to Adelaide City and then stayed there right through my junior career. That's fantastic. So um, did you did you always, obviously, having an older brother also helps uh, competing with somebody slightly bigger, you know, three years with uh, there's a difference between you and Ross three years. So, uh, you know, that, that'd be uh, 10, 15, 20 kilos, depending on the development of the age. But did you find that that competition helped you become a better footballer? Definitely helped me. It uh, it wasn't wasn't only my brother. If we we had a pool table at home and uh, would play quite a bit, and um, my my dad would play with us occasionally, and um, you know he wouldn't let us win. It was like when you're good enough, you, you know you'll beat me, and uh, and that was the same with my brother in terms of we playing any sport in the backyard. And you're right, he was bigger, you know, back then because um, he was three years older and he was better than me. And so I always had to fight and, and, and really push myself to, you know, either beat him or compete with him. Um, so that helped me a lot, uh, especially when I was younger. Then, you know, every game would end up in a fight. So I had to learn how to protect myself as well. And then, uh, and then after that, it was uh, when I started to get bigger and, uh, and stronger than Ross, the, the fighting stopped. But we, yes. <laughs> we didn't play as much either. <laughs> Happy days. So um, you, uh, you obviously uh, played uh, your whole uh, adult life as a forward, but did you in your throughout your junior career did you gravitate to the front of the pitch? Yeah, I started off as a defender. I started <laughs> off uh, well. First of all, when I was uh, five, I you know you play anywhere, and yeah. uh, you know I enjoyed scoring goals. And uh, but then I moved to Adelaide City. I was only seven, and I was playing the under tens, and so I probably wasn't good enough to play at that top mm. end. So where's the position they put you? I'm a left right back. Yeah, oh, left footer, they call me left back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just fill in there. And then um, I played uh, a couple of years also as a central defender. Yeah. And I go, this is not for me. I, I don't enjoy this. So I, I started to push myself up the top of the field and uh, yeah. and, and really enjoyed it. I, I loved, uh, you know, the main thing is, you know, being that selfish striker as, mm. uh, you know, most strikers are a little bit, you know, a little mm. bit, uh, it's about, uh, scoring goals and that's what I love doing you know and that's with the, I stayed there ever since you know I think I was around 12 when I moved up up front. Fantastic and so you were just a baby really when you made the uh, Adelaide uh, City first team. Yeah. Um, talk to me about I mean that, that's a star-studded uh, lineup and you got you got some early um uh, silverware there, you, the year that you guys were there, uh, yeah. you played the. Yeah, that was in '92. So it was, um, look, it, I was fortunate to grow up in Adelaide City. Um, you know, the, the first thing, I'll take it back a little bit. I, I was um, being coached by my dad in mm. the, uh, the youth team, and also he was the coach of the NPL side of Adelaide okay. City. But, um, you know, he didn't select me in the youth team because I know at that stage I was only 14. I wasn't good enough. So he said, mm. you know, 
um, make sure that uh, you, you train hard, you can come training with us. And then, you know, once you're better, then you might get the opportunity because I had to be better than the others because my yes. dad was a coach. So mm. um, it, it, we ended up crossing over. The National Youth League crossed over with the NPL side and he had no players. And uh, one day he came home and he said, you have to play with me. Uh, I think I was just before I turned 15, I would have been still 14. And yeah, um, yeah and this is with adults and men. And uh, we played the, that game and, and I, I started and played quite well. And Zoran Matic, the, the National League coach there, yes. the Adelaide City, the first team coach, he was at the game and he said to my dad after the game, he said, I don't care if it's your son, but um, you must play him all the time now. And he's come to train with me. So that's how I ended up training with the first team at an early age. And, and you're right, there was a star-studded team because we had like, we had internationals, Milan Ivanovic, who was a, a, a you know, he grew up in Serbia, but uh, played for Red Star Belgrade, which is a big Oof. side. Ended up playing for the Socceroos, Alex Tobin, Robert Zabika, the Vidmar brothers, and, you know, and then I'm not even including like your, your Maxwells, your Melters, your Joe Mullins. It was, it was um, great for me because I got to uh, learn off of some, you know, very experienced players that uh, had been, been there, done that. Um, and one of them that really helped me a lot was Aurelio Vidmar. So, yeah, I made my debut at 15 for, for, for the first team. And, um, you know, I was fortunate to be involved in that squad. I mean, like, it, it happens now. I mean, you know, the, the, but the, it, it's amazing. Like, we look at the, that era in the early 90s, how, how many 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old boys... Uh, playing first team football, and uh, so credit to you. I mean, fifteen, you, you're just a baby, baby, and, and you scored a, a few goals that year. Um, yeah, I scored in the cup games. I never scored in the old national league. Um, the, I only really played a couple of games in the old national league because then I went to the Institute of Sport straight yes. after that. I got invited by Ron Smith, and um, and I felt it was a good opportunity to go and and train, you know, virtually full time mm. because uh, the national league side, even though we were, you know, they they were great players and Zoran Matic was a top coach, it still wasn't professional. Um, and so, you know, to go to the Institute of Sport was um, an eye-opener because you leave home. Mm. Um, so it prepares you when you have to go overseas if that's what you want. And uh, and also you're competing against uh, the best of your age group. You know, there might be a couple of a bit older, a couple of a bit younger. And um, again, it was one of those ones that, that you know, trained with Mark Viduka, Craig Moore, Josip Skoko, Clint Bolton. Um, you know, we, we had a really good squad. Vasco Trotesky was a, a star player back then, Robert Ennis. Um, it, it was it was great, and Ron Smith and Steve O'Connor helped us a lot, um, mm. and so th that was good for me uh, personally to develop as a player. And then once I left there, I went back to Adelaide City for a little bit, um, and then I ended up moving overseas soon after that. But, but have a look at this. So the, the vast majority of your footballing uh, life was it your dad who who took you through the ranks? Uh, so was yeah, he main, your coach? yeah, mainly my dad. Mainly he he coached me probably about I wouldn't say the majority of my junior career. Um, a little bit when I got to about yep. 13, 14, That was when yep. he took over and started yep. coaching me. Um, and you know, look, my dad was, was a good coach, but um, you know, a, a lot of it was you know what he'd learned through the years yes. and. Um, you know, I, I think he did coaching education back then, but, uh, you know, he, he was hard on myself and Ross, yep. especially because, you know, he did no favors he, he, for anyone um, and especially not his kids. We had to it's, be better because, you know, if we weren't better, then, you know, <laughs> he was getting blamed. Yeah. But think, think about this um, and what your father you know, helped instilling you is a mentality, and this is this is the the uh, uh, some of the hardest thing because when you get to the AIS, everybody's got talent. Yeah, right? Every, yeah. Or everybody can execute technically. Yeah. But what is the difference now? What's what's going to make you? You know, moving away from home and not knowing how to speak the language, and you know, having those hardships. This is this this old school mentality that you know the beautiful thing of, of 
of, uh, of a European father instilling in a, in a young boy this, this winning mentality and this nature. So uh, hats off to, to what your, your dad instilled in you in a, as, a, as a young boy learning to play football. Yeah, you're right. It's uh, it's one of those things that now looking back, you know, uh, at the time I didn't always like it, mm. um, you know, but uh, because you're right, you know, everyone, I play with many players, even, you know, in Adelaide City that were technically way better than me, um, you know, more gifted. But, um, you know, I, I had that fight because of, you know, growing up with, trying to compete with my brother, but also having my father as a coach. I remember one time that, uh, you know, I was on the bench because he dropped me for, for one game. And um, yeah, he, there was a player that was starting up front and um, he wasn't doing exactly what my dad wanted him to do. So after 15 minutes, he took him off and he, and he put me on. Uh, and, and this is 15 minutes into the game, mind you. And he said, make sure you go on and do well. <laughs> Go do a job for me. Get dragged. It doesn't matter what level it's at, mate. Getting dragged up for 15 minutes is not pleasant. Is no, it? not pleasant. So can you can imagine the way I felt in the change room after the game with that player. Yeah. So the uh, but, okay. So you 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 you're not even you're not even old enough to 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 vote yet. But you've had your dad, your Zoran Matic, and now Ron Smith. Obviously, Zoran. Uh, people can't talk highly of of him as a coach. or short, sure but the the finishing school that you that you were able to cultivate under Ron Smith. You know, full time professional and and that breeding ground of you boys now forming friendships. Talk to me about who were you closest with at the AIS. Um, I was close with most of them. Uh, look, I, I had a good relationship with uh, Mark Viduka as well because both being strikers, um, you know, he was um, he was great also back then. But you know, a lot of people don't realise that uh, Dukes worked hard. You know, mm. Dukes he he worked on his game a lot. And uh, I was living in the same apartment block as him, and uh, he was, uh, I think it was downstairs from me. Then, you know, you could always hear the ball against the wall, against the wall. And this is late at night. And you'd go in there, and he would be drenched with sweat, and you'd be going, Dukes, what have you been doing? And he goes, I've just been, you know, practicing. And he'll do that every night for a couple of hours. So you go, you know, he's not born with it. He worked hard for it. And, um, and that's why he ended up becoming probably the best striker that we've ever produced. And, uh, you know, ended up playing at such a high level. He, he was such a, a good player and a good person as well. Yes, and uh, so uh, so Mark Viduka grew up across the road from me, and so I know, I know firsthand he used to be able to juggle the ball to school. It was like three and a half kilometres away. Yeah. He'd pick up the ball and, and he could, he'd hardly drop it, right? So, um, yes, but you have to work hard. And so any young people watching this, you know, it doesn't just come, it doesn't fall off the tree. You've no. got to put the effort in to get the effort out. So, uh, but, uh, so that, that, that's, that's, that's really nice. And so you, um, from, um, from uh, the finishing school at the AIS, obviously you're playing against, uh, you know, senior men and yeah. you're able to, to, to uh, learn to become a, like, for lack of a better word, a yeah. professional footballer. Yeah. Did that help going overseas? Yeah, it did help. Um, it, it, the, the main thing, look, we were advanced as well in terms like Ron Smith back then with Steve O'Connor used to, you know, d do analysis with us, um, which analysis didn't come in until 20 years later. But, you know, mm. they would show us video analysis, not so much of our games, but, uh, you know, mainly I'll just say, for instance, I was a striker, so they, they would bring me upstairs and show me, you know, Gary Lineker, how he scored goals and his movement inside the box and how he lost his player. And, um, and you know, you'd work on that then and you'd look at it and you'd think, OK, you know, when the player's about to cross the ball, he's just on the shoulder of the defender and then the last minute he nips in front. You know, they're, they're things that... Uh, you know, lucky that we were learning at that age. When you go overseas, you realise that, that uh, we had it really good at the AIS. We had the best facilities. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of overseas clubs back then had great facilities. They, you know, they were better than what the old National League teams were, but they weren't great. Definitely didn't do video analysis. Um, and, you know, you were left on your own, really. Yeah. You had to fight with everyone to get Single a... Single swim. Yeah, that's yeah, it's it. a sink or swim. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think the the actual living away from home prepared me mm. um, because you know coming from Italian background, I was uh, you know I wouldn't say I was a mummy's boy, but I I loved you know yeah. 
being around my family a lot. Yes. Um, so the, the, the time that I spent at the AIS helped me, um, you know, when I had to go overseas. But look, nothing can prepare you <laughs> for when you go over there because it is tough. And the other thing too is that whole that whole institute. Anyone who's gone to Canberra would know. You know, you've got the main uh, main quarters, and then across the road, all the living quarters. But you're there with you know the best other people of the other sports. And yes. this high performance is a is a mentality, a winning mentality. And it's amazing how many pe- people from your group in the AIS then ended up becoming Socceroos down the track in the same group. So it was the a bit of a breeding ground, uh, maybe a maybe a tip for those uh, in um, football administration might be an idea um, if we one idea of, of how we might become better. Um, okay, so uh, I, I think you were you hadn't yet turned eighteen, and you get a you get a go out of uh, Standard Liège to go play in their their second side is that yeah so i was only 16 when i went over the, oh, just wow. before i turned 17 yeah so wow. um it was only a month and then i turned 17 years old i was at okay. standard liege yeah their reserve team um and it was an opportunity because you know they, they signed me i went first two week trial uh, they liked what they saw then and they signed me um but that was that was tough because it was in the winter time and it was about minus seven degrees uh, i couldn't speak any french um, and I was, uh, but it was, that was also, you know, good because it was, yep. uh, it toughened you up because you, again, you know, you're, you're on the outer, uh, people don't want to talk to you, you know, especially when I was on trial that no one spoke English. And then all of a sudden when I signed for him, there's a few players that would speak to me in English. Whereas before that, no one did. I, see, I don't think people understand. These people don't want to even pass the ball. Right. Yeah. So let alone, they won't, they won't, they won't they'll talk to you. Where do you sit? Where's your locker? Where's yeah. your whatever? No, no, not like us Aussies, yeah. come and have a coffee with me. Let's take yeah. you out, yeah. make you part of the group. Um, tell us tell us about, it, it, I mean, you've you, you played for a lot of teams, but did you experience that as an Aussie abroad? If you, you know, you have to come in and do a job, um, but do you, do you feel that it took a time for us Aussie, for being an Aussie in there, in that, yeah. in that world? Yeah, it, it did. It took a little bit of time. Look, we, uh, when I went... The, there was a couple of Australians that had already done well in Belgium. So you had mm. that little bit of respect. I wouldn't yeah. say that they, they would, like you said, you know, if, if they didn't want to pass you the ball, they wouldn't pass you the ball. And, you know, they, we also had a couple of, you know, uh, run-ins and fights in training, you know, mm. the, the guy kicking you because you're an Australian and didn't mm. want you to take his mate's place and, and yep. whatever else in the side. So, but we had a bit of respect because Frank Farina, Graham Arnold, Aurelia yes. Bidmar, you know, Paul Ocon. They, Paul Ocon was there doing, at the time. Yeah. yeah. So they've been doing well. And so that there, yes. Um, but you always had that in the background. They, they would always want a Brazilian or uh, an Argentinian um, mm. or even, you know, someone from Africa over an Australian because, mm. you know, that was the flavour of the month and it still is the flavour. Mm. Um, so you had to make sure you were better even than, you know, the Brazilians or else mm. you weren't going to get a go. The um, did, did you did you try and speak with the other Aussie boys? Because I think uh, Ocon was there at the time. Uh, Lawrence Kidner was there. At, uh, uh, yeah, he was there as well. With Lawrence Kidner. Yeah, I remember. I didn't um, actually speak to Lawrence Kidner. I, I, I think I might have played against him. George okay. Kuskar was there at yes. Antwerp. Um, the one that I kept in contact was Aurelio Vidma, which okay. he, he was great help for, for me. Um, you know, every day off, you know, would go either drive to where he was or he'd drive to where I was and uh, spend the day helps, together. Helps and, being both Adelaide boys, right? Yeah, so, yeah, 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 that, yeah. That, that, that helped Fantastic. a lot. Um, now, and then I moved to Royal Antwerp and George Kulska was there. Okay, so, good. you know, so it, it was good, you know, that, that was a, an easier transition, if you like, because it was the Flemish part of Belgium and I could speak English, you know, whereas in the French part, not many people spoke, uh, spoke English. So that, that became an easier transition for me. Mm-hmm. And obviously, um, you know, these are very high standard leagues and you, you, you're still quite young. I mean, the, the, you're learning your trade, you're applying your trade, you, you're playing in that sort of, uh, that I would call that, that second tier. What are the memories that uh, of you, uh, let's say, for example, at Antwerp, what, what springs to mind? What are some of the stories there? Yeah, the, the first thing that springs to my I was um, my debut. I came off the bench and uh, and I scored. 
So, you know, I was still only 17 at that, that stage as well. So that, that was, you know, a nice feeling, you know, that you go, okay, you know, I can do it with uh, these senior boys. Um, you know, I'd been training with them for a little bit and got my opportunity and I scored. And then my first start was against Paul Ocon, uh, against Club Bruges. So, oh, he, you know, yeah, so that was really good. So chatting to him during the game and, and whatever else. So that was, that was nice. Um, and yeah, so that those Antwerp they, because you would bump into you know certain Australians around the league, um, but uh, you know it was mainly getting you know your first opportunity in Europe and starting in the first team was uh, a big you know not bonus or plus or anything like that, but it was you know you think okay maybe I can make it over here because there's still question marks if you can mm. or not. And and was that a, at what age did you think? okay, I want to play in the highest, I mean, was that a boyhood dream? He's like, I want to play for my, you know, insert yeah. name club. Was that always that that draw card you wanted to, to go overseas? Yeah, it was always a boyhood dream of mine um, ever since I, you know, I, I think when I realised I might have an opportunity of making a career out of it was when I went to nationals down in, in Tasmania. Uh, the, I think it was the under-14 national championship and I was leading goal scorer of the the championship, you know, South Australia play the you know, yeah, yeah, New South yeah. Wales, Victoria. And so then after that, I thought, well, you know what? I might have a chance here. So, you know, th- that gives you that belief that you keep working hard and, and eventually it might happen. And then you see uh, the, the players that had made it from Australia. Eddie Krinchevich was another one that I used yes. to while he was over there. Um, you know, you go, okay, the, the, you know, they've shown the, the pathway for us. So, mm-hmm. you know, we've, we've got that size so we can do it. Um but, you know, a dream as a kid was always to go play in the Serie A. And, um, you, and you got that opportunity so straight after. So, yeah. uh, Criminese, obviously, uh, you know, uh, you know what, a, what a, obviously, you know, teams like that are, uh, are never going to be uh, world beaters. But no. the, the, just the sheer fact of playing now in the Serie A, being able to play against the world's best, now we, we talk about literally legends of the game yeah. were marking you. That, yeah, that's yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. What, a, what a trip out. Yeah, so, no, that, that was, uh, you know, I don't think I was ready for it in terms mm-hmm. of, uh, I wouldn't say uh, level-wise uh, and, you know, the, my ability. I think mentally I wasn't ready for the, the, the actual scrutiny that you come under in Italy, mm-hmm. um, you know, because I'd never received that sort of scrutiny before. And, uh and so that was an eye opener, but um, you know it, it was an unbelievable experience because uh, you know the uh, again you know I was only nineteen playing for a team that was going to fight relegation. But yes. it, was, it was in the middle of the season when I ended up going there, and they were already you know down the bottom. So yes. it, 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 it was going to be hard for us to survive. But you know two games in, and I'm playing at the San Siro against Inter Milan, and you've got uh, Roberto Carlos flying up the left side there. <laughs> And then a few yeah. games later, you know, you play, you're starting against AC Milan. You got Franco Baresi and Costa <laughs> marking you, um, Paolo Maldini on the other side. Yeah. So you just go on. These are Italian legends, and yeah. at that time, Serie A was the best competition in the, in the world. Uh, yeah, AC course. Milan was the best team in the world. Of course. Um, so it, that was uh, you know a great experience. Now looking back, you know, it was uh, it was good, and it, it did help me as well later on in my career to be able to deal with the, the pressures of, yeah. you know, being a striker at, at, a, at a high level. Now, uh, the, the question I wanted to ask you, did, did it help understanding being of an Italian background, being able to speak the language, that transition in the city, did that help at all? Or? Um, uh, look, it, they still looked at me as a foreigner because I mm-hmm. still was a foreigner. And back then you only allowed three foreign players. So mm-hmm. that, that, that made it hard. Um, my Italian wasn't good because I didn't speak it at home. My parents didn't uh, teach me Italian because they only spoke the Calabrese dialect. So <laughs> they, they said that, that would actually hurt you in the long term, knowing that dialect instead of the proper Italian. Yeah. Um, but I picked the, the Italian up uh, quicker than most other mm. languages. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, the transition was still hard. I, I found that not only because, you know, the reporters are on top of you and, and criticising you and whatever, that your own supporters ended up criticising you a lot. And, and I was like, well, I've never experienced this before. So, you know, and especially when you're a striker and a foreigner, yeah. it, it's even harder. 
well, you, you're there to do a job, and obviously, you know, when it's when you when you're playing for a team that's in that relegation battle, every goal counts, right? So I can I can sort of sympathise them, but it's a, a good learning experience. And from what I take it, yeah, Terry Venables was uh, uh, sort of helped you make your way up to uh, Portsmouth. Is is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, Venables was uh, the national team coach, uh, and and you know, he's the one that selected me first to, to give me my debut for the national team back in '97 in uh, Macedonia. Actually, it was uh, in Skopje. Um, we uh, then after that we got relegated. This is it wasn't a, a happy time at Cremonese. We got relegated from Serie A to Serie B, and then Serie B to Serie C. Oh. And I was like, oh, oh, I don't want to be playing Serie C because I didn't want to drop down another level. Um, and Venables was the chairman of Portsmouth at that time. And he said, look, you know, we'd like to sign you there. Um, and it was a championship side. You know, it wasn't uh, in the Premier League at the time, but it was still a decent level. And I thought, you know what, I probably need to take a step back to go forwards again, you know, to get my confidence to score goals. And, and mm. I thought it was a good opportunity, opportunity for me at Portsmouth. And uh, sort of uh, talk to me about the the being at Portsmouth that that sort of being near the sea, the blowing the what what was the the feeling like the having that sea air come onto the pitch and yeah. uh, you know what it's a tough place to play it, yes you know because the wind just swirls around <laughs> you know on the pitch if you, if you got any like you know if there was any uh, chip wrapping paper or something <laughs> like that you'd see it just swirling around so it wasn't an easy place to play mm. especially for the the opposition players the, the actual changing rooms were were tiny the opposition changing rooms were like really small Yes. Um, but so, but that's what the old stadiums had. You know, they made it uncomfortable for the opposition. Um, yeah. But there's, know, a, the, there's the, a certain charm there as well. Yeah, uh, that's right. Playing in these small, uh, small stadiums is a certain charm about the place. Yeah. You can feel it. Yeah. You know, when you're coming to one of those, it's going to make it hard. To, to get points away from yeah. home. And the same is true when they when opposition come to you, you're going to make it a little bit harder because it is a, a little bit of a fortress. Yeah, that's right. And and their supporters, Portsmouth supporters were incredible. They they were, um, you know, always singing, always, you know, they'll take 5,000, 10,000 supporters away, um, you know, for the away games. And uh, they always created a good atmosphere. And so... You know, it was, um, look, Portsmouth had its ups and downs. The, the, you know, the up were the, the football side of things. You know, I was playing regular football, scoring goals. But then uh, Venables left and we had like five uh, other Australians there. And so, you know, the, the new people that came in didn't want us and, and mm. slowly just got rid of everyone. Um, and uh, I got told that I could leave as well. So the, the last probably you know, 10 games of that season, I didn't play. And then they said in the off season, just find another club. And, and I didn't because I didn't have anything better to go to. So I went back and, and fought for my spot. And um, by December, I'd scored 17 goals in all comps and got sold to Coventry City. So it, was, nice. yeah, it worked out better for me, um, you know. And that, again, that was that fighting spirit that I had to, had to have. Well, if I, if I, if I actually typify something about your playing style um in that's what i would think that you had tons of you know if you had to line up if god was handing out a uh you know sort of tickets uh, you must have lined up for the fighting spirit line you know more than everybody else because i knew every time you went on the pitch and you're up front you know you're going to give everything of, of yourself you know you're going to leave your heart on the pitch by by hook or by crook you're going to insert yourself in the game to try and get those opportunities to score and i think that's and and where you were you also used in the national team you were also used in that sort of uh, in that vein they know if they're going to put you up front you're going to go there do a job and try and go in there and f- uh, force the opposition and get the get the job done so um We'll we'll circle back to the to the national team because obviously you, you represented the national team um, quite. But your, your time at Coventry, um, there's, there's some big names there. So, so yeah. uh, Gary McAllister, uh, Robbie Keane, Mustafa Haji, just to uh, name a few. I mean, so talk to me about some of these characters. 
Yeah. Oh, look, um, they were great players. You know, Robbie Keane was, uh, he was only 19 when he signed with us. He signed uh, at that time was a record amount for, for us. It was uh, six million pounds. And, uh, but you could see straight away as soon as he, you know, in training, it was incredible. The, just the awareness that he had and, you know, his movement off the ball and then on the ball when he could score goals. Um, you know, he only stayed with us for a year and then he got sold to Inter Milan for 12 million pounds. Um, didn't work out from there and then he moved on but you know great great talent uh, at that stage and he ended up having a great career Gary McAllister was a little bit older mm. and um, but you knew what you're going to get from Gary McAllister technically he was uh, in terms of his passing range I, I don't think I've come across anyone that could put it wherever they wanted to you know mm. so it was always when you had the, he had the ball and you made a run he would find you oh, wow. um, and, uh, you know, e even set pieces, you know, corners were dangerous because he could put it anywhere he wanted to. Um, and then he ended up going to play for Liverpool after that and, uh, you know, kept his career going at a high level. So, mm. you know, Mustafa Hadji was one of those players. You know, he had so much ability, but he was a hard worker. He used, to, he used to run and fight. And you could actually count on him, in you know, when things were down. I remember he had a badly bruised foot. And he could virtually couldn't even put his boot on, um, but he wanted to play because he wanted to give you know everything for the team and then show that you know he was there to support. So he ended up getting a, a piece of thin uh, steak uh, from the butcher and, uh, and and putting the meat in his boot. So it, it sort of took the cushioning away, <laughs> <laughs> and he played the whole game with a piece of meat in, in his, his boot. boot. <laughs> Get out of town! I've never heard that before in my life. Me, I've never seen it before in my life, but it was uh, it was funny because that just showed the character he was. Ah. You know, he he would get everything for his team. And um, so, in your second year there, you suffered from a pretty serious injury and um, didn't play for the most of that year. So, talk to me about that setback and what that does to you mentally in order to treasure football, love football, um, and that fighting spirit now what's going through your mind yeah. now your first that, big injury that that was the hardest part i, I think it was the hardest uh, thing i had to deal with in my career because okay. you, you know you're right about um, you know it, it, something that you love doing and um, no matter whether you're you're playing or not playing you're you're going and training every day with your teammates and you know you you have your ups and downs of course when you're, you're starting or even when you're uh, not doing well but not being able to join your teammates every day and watching them train. Um, but the, the hardest thing was, because I remember it well, I injured myself against Leeds. We lost the game, I think it was 4-3. I scored a goal and just before half time, um, I felt something go in the back of my hamstring, but it was very low. Didn't feel too bad. And, um, you know, I just, you know, started to get into the starting 11, partnering Robbie Keane up front. And um, I came off and then that week there, it felt okay come Friday and they did a fitness test with me because we played, we we're going to play Tottenham on the Saturday and I was going to start and uh, I started to, to train and then uh, get into it. And I just felt it really go. Um, and then did you go snap? It was, yeah, did you went snap? snap. Yeah. And, then, and from there, it was always, I was close. I was close to getting back and then it would go again and it would go again. And I had all these tests done and, you know, so it was messing with my mind, badly um you know i didn't know anything about depression back then but i'm sure i went through you know there were some days you just don't want to get out of bed you know you don't want to see people um, you don't I, I didn't know if i was ever going to get back playing or not you know one of the tests they found that i had partially torn my acl hmm. and so it was very lax and it was putting all the pressure on my hamstring sure. and uh, you know i had scan after scan um, but the thing is, because it was so like moved like that, you know, my hamstring was, you know, never really recovering until, um, you know, that whole year, until the end of that season, um, someone put me in contact with a Dutch physio um, that I went over for two weeks and spent every day with him all day for two weeks. And he got my um, body and my leg to a level that I was en ended up being able to come back from it. Oh, and nice. um, I ended up using that physio for the rest of my career in Europe. Uh, whenever I had an injury, 
I would fly him into whether it was Spain or England or, or wherever I was yep. to treat me and get me back on the pitch. It was it was out of my own pocket, but I yep. knew that I had to do it to to stay out on the football pitch. And uh, these are the things that people don't talk about: the having somebody who knows your body, yeah, uh, knowing how you know how your body moves, how it thing, and having the conversation. So when you say I'm feeling this little. They know what you mean because yeah. you've had that relationship with them, right? Yeah. Any 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 person who's gone through any physical activity and has this support group of people that know and gets to know your body. So hats off. Uh, so that gentleman's name that helped you is probably string helped you along for for a long time. Well, his name is Andre Van Alp, and if you look him up, he uh, he owns Physio Concept in Holland, and he's done really well. Uh, he's uh, I think a lot of his rehab w- was with uh, Van Dyke recently. Okay. Van Dyke ended up doing. He, he he's probably um, if not the best physio that I've ever seen. He's, he's definitely up there. Yeah. Um, I, I owe him my career, to, you know, yeah. to, to get me back on the pitch because it will, it was virtually no one could help me, and uh, yeah. uh, you know, it, it did cost me a bit of money, but I'm glad I spent it. Well, this, but this is the thing. It, it's not only that. It, it does your head in when you can't do the things that you want to do. Um, so I did have to change my uh, my running. Uh, you know, yeah, my running gait changed. You know, um, so when I was younger, you know, obviously you move a lot freer, and uh, you know, I was a little bit quicker. And then after this injury, my gait changed completely. So what I had to do was virtually change my game quite a bit as well I couldn't play in the shoulder as much and run in behind as much you know I had to get the ball to feed and try and you know hold the ball up yeah and and you know that that was something that I had to improve on and you know so I had to adapt to my body again you know because my body was wasn't in great shape yeah got it so um but yeah you you uh obviously the highest division in England. So what springs to mind? I follow Chelsea. So you, you're, you're getting on the same pitch as Zola. I mean, how good's are that, right? Yeah. So what are some of the other names of people that you thought, oh, geez, is this real? I've got to pinch myself because now I know that I'm playing with, with legends. So what... Yeah, at, at the time, you know what? You, you're always excited to play against those teams because they're teams that you know, you've seen your whole life growing up. But, you know, you don't look at it. You, sometimes on the out in the pitch, you might go, yeah, you know, that was incredible what Zola just did, you know, the way he turned and, and, and shivered away or Ronaldinho or Zidane or whatever. But when you're out on the pitch, you're mainly focused on what you have Doing to do. Doing your job. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, like we, uh, that year uh, when I came back from injury, I ended up playing uh, against Man United and, uh, and scoring against them. And that was that treble winning season. Yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, it was good to, to, you're playing against the best and then with the best, you know, you talk about some of the players that you know, at Coventry, they were, they were great players, world-class players. So, you know, it was, it was good to be involved at that level. And uh, it, it's interesting that you say that. So instead of being in awe of these players, it's thinking, okay, how can I get the ball off them? How can I kick them? How can I yeah. fight to get in there and win that header or yeah. do, do something special for my side? That's a, it's a interesting insight. The um, And you, uh, in, uh, I think it was 2000, just 2001, you make your way over to, yeah. to Spain. How, how, did, how did that transpire? Um, I think they saw me play in England. They also saw me with the national team. And um, at the time, you know, an agent got in, uh, in contact with me and said, would you like to go to Spain? And uh, Crystal Palace were in the championship and it was Steve Bruce actually had contacted me. And, uh, you know, I had to decide, well, what do I do? Is I'll stay in England um, or do I go across to Spain? It's a different adventure, but, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it was going to be in the top division, so it wasn't going to be in the championship you know, and uh, and I said, you know what, I, I want to play and, and try and play against the the best in Spain and and just you know have a different experience. It was a uh, it was a big call because you know don't speak any Spanish. Um, I didn't know anyone in Spain. Um, I didn't you know no Australians have really had gone there and made you know name of it. Um, Aurelio really Vidma had gone to Tenerife for a little bit, but didn't go his way and didn't play as much as he would have liked um so you know i decided to go and uh, and you know luckily i did because they were the years i enjoyed the most in my football career and uh so was it last year or the year before you made a bit of a return back to to osuna to and that you were welcomed back um and the, the fans were 
uh, chanting your name and your Spanish is pretty good. I, I uh, saw, so uh, how, would you, how would you rate your Spanish uh, now? Conversational? Oh. Yeah, yeah, conversational. Yeah, look, I, I try and um, read the Spanish paper as much as possible because, it, you know, in Spanish, it keeps my, my, yeah. Um, yeah, my level up a little bit. And then, you know, if I ever coach Spanish players, I try and speak to them a little bit. So, yeah, yeah which I have, you know, Corona at Brisbane Roar. And, you know, so it, it, it's, it's important that you try and keep it going yeah. because it, it's, it's hard to, to keep that. But it was great going back to Osasuna. You know, it was... Uh, I think it was 15 years since I'd scored or played my last game was in the Spanish Cup final against Real Betis. Yes. And, um, you know, the amount of people that stopped me uh, in the city of Pamplona, which is where Osasuna is, uh, to talk to me about that goal is is very similar to what people were like here with the, the penalty. You know, yes. it, that's so what people good. remember me for is the, the, the Spanish that, Cup that final. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, talk, talk, walk us through sort of how that the ball was played in. You yeah. played across and... Yeah, you're there. Happy days. So, uh, Osasuna's now 100 years old. It, it that was the first and only time they've ever been to a Spanish Cup final, yes. and um, and so you know the whole build up to it was amazing. Um, there was uh, you know I think it was around 25,000 Osasuna supporters, 25,000 Real Betis oh, supporters, yes. and you know it was down the end. Uh, I scored down the end where all the Osasuna supporters were. They were all in red. Mm. And um, but we were one nil down, and there was only about five minutes to go. And I remember, you know, Sava Milosevic, uh, who was a top um, Serbian international, was playing up front with with him. He played the ball out wide to a French player called uh, uh, Del Port, and um, he I knew he was going to cross it to the back post. So okay. I automatically just drifted to the back post, and um, you know it was a great ball in, and you know I just got my head on it, and uh, and all I can remember is the the noise, you know, in that stadium, and uh, it was. Uh, it was unfortunate because we lost in extra time because we went to extra time. Yeah. And, and I could have scored the, again in extra time. I should have scored again in extra time. But, um, you know, that day there is something that will live with me because it was my last game for Osasuna as well. Yeah. So it was a, a big moment. And uh, off, off comes the top. Like, uh, you... uh, no, no, I didn't take the top off in that no, game. No, not in that game. I took the top off uh, for Osasuna before, though, okay. a couple of times. One was... Uh, for, we were fighting relegation and there was a, we needed one point in the second last game of the season because we didn't want to go down to the last game. And we played Athletic Bilbao, which was a rivalry. Oh, between, okay. yeah. And I scored and, uh, and the top came off and the celebration <laughs> happened. So, yeah, it, 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 that was before the actual Uruguay moment as well. Okay, yeah. So uh, you, you're building up to this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're building up to this, uh, taking the top off. Um, so... Um, Obviously, um, we'll probably we'll, we'll circle back uh, now because I you played for for Alaves as well in uh, in uh, uh, Spain and um, maybe we can we can briefly touch on your, your time uh, with Alaves. Yeah, you know what we we had a really good side. Um, we ended up getting relegated that year, was which um, it was a lot to do with the the chairman we had, or our owner. Mm. It was a, a Ukrainian American millionaire that just, just was uh, not great for our club. Um, he he wasn't paying the players, and you know it, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a shambles. And he sacked about three coaches that season. <laughs> it was you know something that um, I've never had experience, and I never want to experience again because yeah. he would just you know what he was doing to the, the club in general was was not fair for the supporters yeah. and not fair for the city of uh, Victoria where Alaves is because it's a it's a great city yeah. um, great club with history you know played in the Europa League final uh, against Liverpool um, you know a few years before I was there uh, but we, we had a good side and, and you know we started the season slowly I didn't start the first half of the season the second half of the season I started nearly every game and scored 10 goals um, which was a really good return in you know half the season um, but that, that's probably where I was playing my best at my at my top level I was okay. you know I was confident and I was and it was just before the 2006 World Cup so that, I, I headed into the World Cup with confidence even <laughs> though we got relegated yeah. but that was a you know a, a great um, group of players as well they, they were 
great guys, nice guys, and uh, keep in contact with a few of them still. So um, let's let's circle back. Obviously, you uh, you talk about the, the time that you got to wear the national team jersey. You got to wear it uh, fairly early on in your career as well. Um, but maybe we talk about that first uh, national team cap. Um, what's it like listening to standing up there in the line and listening to the national anthem any time that you're on the pitch? Uh, what is that feeling like? I don't think there's any better feeling because it's, you know, it's your nation. It's something that, you know, I remember grow, growing up and watching, you know, all the World Cup qualifiers uh, you know, through the years and, you know, always just missing out. The one that first comes to memory, you know, was uh, when we got kicked out against Israel um, yeah. and Frank Arrock was in charge and, you know, he was pointing at his watch. And, yeah, Sham uh, that referee. Yeah, Shambles. yeah. And then, and then you know, the, the, the Scotland game, uh, yeah. you know, at Olympic Park. And then, you know, you go the forward even more and, you know, there was so many near misses. The Argentina game in 93, you know, that was when I realised, you know, we can compete, you know, because we drew 1-1 with Argentina in, in Sydney. Uh, you know, and Aurelio Vidma, who I was training with, was ended up, you know, scoring the goal, Tony Vidma setting him up. So then you start to think, all oh, right, you know, national team can, you know, be on the card. So when you actually finally get there, it's it's the best feeling that, you know, you can have, you know, listening mm-hmm. to the national anthem, getting ready to play. And, uh, and you just feel uh, you grow even more as a player because you believe that you can do more with your national team, you know, because yeah. a lot of them you've grown up with as well, you know, so... That's so who, who was your roomie? Who, who, who did you spend most of that? Well, at the start was Aurelio Vidmar. Spent okay. most time with him. Uh, also spent time with Tony Vidmar um, quite a bit in the national team um, in, in terms of room partners. And then right at the end was, uh, at the World Cup, was Scott Chipperfield uh, because okay. Tony Vidmar missed out because of his heart problem that he had. Yeah. Um, so, but that Aurelio and Tony were mainly my room partners, uh, you know, during the national team setup. There you go. So, uh, keep the Adelaide connection going. All right. Yeah. Any, my any, first game, though, was, my so first who, game was, was Mark Bosnich was my room partner. Oh, and, and, I, day, so. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to be with Bosner ever again. Okay. That, that <laughs> would be the best room. <laughs> you know what? He was, um, it, it was against, it was, it was in Skopje and, and he probably doesn't remember it because he probably doesn't remember that he roomed with me. But um, the reason why I say it is because Bosner was a top guy and he still is a top guy. But um, he, he just always needs to be doing something. Of course. And, you know, and in his room, he had these hands sort of weight uh, <laughs> things that he was squeezing to, to strengthen his hands. You know? Yes. He, he was always looking for that edge. And, and, and I remember talking to him about, you know, even back then, his training regime. And he, he was always gaining that, that edge because he wanted to be the best in the world. And at the time, he was at least in the top three goalkeepers in the world. He was, he was brilliant. Um, you know, he, he could have had a better career. He knows that. Um, but, you know, he played at the top level for a number of years. He played with, you know, Man United and won trophies. And, um, but, yeah, I didn't want to ruin him because I would never have slept because he would have just kept me yeah. awake all night. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Since, since the sensibility. So, uh, and uh, did, who, was the, who was the dirtier uh, brother? So, really, uh, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, they're both pretty clean. They're clean. Both, okay. they're, they're, they're both good roommates, you know, right. well organised. Uh, so, no, it, it was easy. Yeah, I was lucky discipline. to have them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. You had the discipline room. Yeah. The, um, so, um, tell us about um, going the first time you guys went um, to uh, understanding the Montevideo. Uh, oh, yeah. That was, uh, you know what? It was actually. Uh, was it comical or was it irritating? It was, no, it was a little bit comical. Uh, but at the time, we didn't know, you know, what to expect. We thought that we had no protection. So, you know, we, we play in Melbourne. We get a good result, 1-0. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we head back over to, to – well, we head over to Montevideo. And, um, you know, it, it took it ages. It felt like an eternity. I can't remember how long to get out of the actual airport itself because – They, they you know, held you up, yeah? They gave yeah. some bull- – yeah, BS so, reason why to uh, just hold uh, you up. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was just ridiculous. And then you walk outside, and all of a sudden, you've got to, there's a, you know, a few police officers that weren't really doing anything, and you've got these supporters, you know, banging drums, singing, spitting on us. 
Wow. It was it was sort of making out, or or you felt they were going to attack you, but they they probably were never going to attack you. And they, and you know, as you got on the bus, you know, we we're watching the others come out, and I remember like Paul O'Connor with his hands over his head <laughs> like this, and then um, Frank Farina was one of the last ones, and the poor guy got spit all over his face, and <laughs> you know, and we'll, yeah. it was it was bad. It was yeah, bad. it's but it's hard. So in those moments, you're wearing the you're wearing the the national uh, you know emblem, right? And what you want to do is throw fisty cuffs, yeah. but you know you can't <laughs> because you're wearing the if you were if it was other like if you were just wearing a black jacket, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're part of the Aussie soccer did you just like throw fisty cuffs with these people? But you because you're wearing obviously the yeah. the, the uh, and, and, you guys had added aspect in the yeah. Adidas, uh, kids with the national emblem. You know you got to do the right thing. You know 40, 50 of these crazy Uruguayans. Yeah. So, but look, it, was, it was funny because after that, I, I ended up playing with uh, a couple of Uruguayans at Osasuna, the, the, the guy who scored two goals against us in that game, Chinga Morales, and mm. also uh, Pablo Garcia, who was one of their midfielders. And um, they said to me that, that those uh, the ones that were singing and spitting on us and making out they're going to attack us were paid. They were the homeless people. They were paid yeah. there to come there and cause it, you know, to make it hard for us, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, it wasn't only that. They, the, the training facility was rubbish, you know. It was, yeah. it, they just made it difficult. Whereas four yeah. years later when we went, you know, we were prepared for it. We knew yeah. what was coming. Um, you guys went to Argentina, didn't you? Yeah, we went to Argentina for a week to train at, uh, I think it was at, at San Lorenzo's uh, Stadium. Yeah. Um, so it was out of, you know, the spotlight yeah. of the Uruguayans. So we only went there the night before the game and, um, and that was all smooth and, yeah. you know, we, you know, had people obviously abusing us on the street and that, but we found it funny this time, yeah. you know, it was, it was more, okay. You're now ready. You now know what you're, yeah. yeah. All right. So um, the, we, we cop, uh, we cop one over there, probably respectable loss. If, if you could call it that um, we now we've got somebody of stature, um, Gus Hiddink, obviously, is, you know, well-renowned. What was he like in the dressing room in terms of, uh, you know, uh, did he just command a presence that you just, everybody just shut up and sit there and listen? Yeah, he, he, he did. He did. He, like, straight away, there's, there's certain coaches that um, have got a presence and, and you respect straight away for what they've done in the game anyway. You know, it, whether it's been an ex-player that's played at the highest level, like Zidane walking into back into the Real Madrid training room. Um, and Gus Hiddink was, you know, what he had achieved at uh, the club level, uh, where he had coached at club level, you know, coached the Real Madrid, he, you know, won the, the European uh, Champions League. Or back then it was a European Cup with PSV. Mm-hmm. Um, it took the Dutch national team to the World Cup and did well. It took, uh, you know, Korea, South Korea to the semi-final of the World Cup. Um, so as soon as he came in, we there was automatic respect, and then he was hard. He was a mm. hard person, and a lot of it was mind games that he used to play with everyone. But um, the thing that I noticed that lead up to, and we're talking about the friendly games and and the earlier games before the Uruguay game, he was on top of us, yelling at us, screaming at us, mm. so putting mm. us on edge. And then all of a sudden, you come the biggest game you know, of the four years that to, to play for the World Cup qualifier against Uruguay. And he just was in the chain room and he was calm and uh, didn't say a word. And then during the game, didn't say much. And and so automatically that gave that calmness over to us. And mm. you know, we had a we had a very experienced side though as well. So yes. Gus Hiddink was brilliant, but we were also experienced and know and knew what to expect as well from the Uruguayans. And obviously, so I... I, I uh... Just uh, sort of fast forward after you scored that goal, I remember him sort of just sitting, standing there, you know, drinking his Gatorade or whatever the bottle was. And I don't know if it actually sunk in what, because, you know, all the other boys, Graham Arnold, you know, Cody Franken, you know, on the bench jumping up, you know, after you after you uh, put the ball in the back of the net and the whole world's erupted, he was just sort of like, sort of like yeah, I'm here to do a job. Maybe, maybe that, maybe he didn't really grasp what that moment was in Australian football and the gravitas of that moment. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, you're right there. I, he probably didn't really. I never asked him that, um, you know, since, you know, why he just stood there. I, I actually think you're right. I don't think he realised how big the moment was for yes. us. Yeah. Um, because, you know, what he achieved in his career, like he was qualifying for a World Cup, you know, that was, he, he thought that was going to be a given, you know, mm. or, um, you know, he was thinking, well, oh, well yeah, if, if they lose, I'll go up. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm out I get of here. It, right. Yeah, so he didn't have that same, you know, as what, the everyone else had, you know, your grandma mm. would have been through, you know, how many World Cup campaigns, Tony, uh, Frank in the same, you know, Anthony Creer, who was our conditioning coach, the same, you know, mm. um, the, the, the physios, all, all we're yeah. all been there for a long period. So for yeah. us, it was, you know, this is yeah, now or never. Right. Yeah. And probably, probably the reason why now I advocate that only an Aussie should take the job because only we know what it's like to make it or not make it. And that's why we're so vested. I think it's important. I mean, overseas coaches have done a job for us. Um, but now I, for one, would like to advocate that that own, we've got the talent here. Uh, we've got the experience. Um, I think from now on, we should be mature enough um, to back our own. And we've done that now successfully now on on. on two occasions, I mean, more than two occasions. I mean, obviously, yeah. we've had Aussies do the job before, even in in, in, in in losses, but now in successful bids as well. So, yeah. and, and long may it continue. Um, so, uh, obviously, I know that he had his, uh, hitting had his favourites. So I remember once you, you saying that, you know, he would toss the ball up to, you know, Harry or <laughs> the Duke, and then he'd come to you, he'd spin the ball and make it all spastic. So his first touch would come off the off the boot. So you could just, uh, uh, that's the reason why you're, I've got you on the, on the Yeah, pitch. That, that were the mind games that he played. And, okay. uh, you know, but he, he did have his favourites. So they probably won't admit to it, but, uh, you, know, did, yeah. you know, like Harry, do Timmy, you know, you could just sense it in training, and then the the others he would actually treat us, you know, quite yeah. quite tough as well. And but it's interesting. So he also knew where to keep his weapons too. So it's not not the first time that he would put Harry on the bench no, as well right. or Timmy on the bench as well. Yeah. Yeah. These are weapons would play could probably line up in in any of those other teams in starting eleven. But he's thinking, no, no, I'm going to go slightly different and keep keep my powder dry. Um, so uh, I want I want to go to that to that moment. When did you know you were going to take the penalty? Um, look, I knew that uh, if we went to a penalty shootout and I was on the pitch, that I'd be one of the ones that could take it. Um, you know, we practiced penalties the day before. Um, I had taken a few penalties with my my club, um, and then you know I ended up staying behind and practicing five penalties uh, the night before the game as well. And uh, so when it came to yeah, Graham Arnold and Gus coming over, I can only remember Graham Arnold saying, "You know who wants to take a penalty?" and and uh, I just remember putting up my hand straight away. I said, "Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I'll take one." And um, and you know and. He asked me, okay, I'll, I'll put you number one. I said, no, no, put me number five. I just had that feel. I just had that feel for a long period that, you know, and, that and could I've go. Heard you, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I've heard you say that you dreamt that moment for years before, that somehow yeah. you knew that, like, you somehow manifested this, that you that you had a sense that there was going to be an occasion. That yeah. You were gonna... So I'd, I'd um, been involved in two previous World Cup campaigns and, and the, you know, we all know that, the, you know, when you're playing at Solomon Islands and New Zealand and all that, it, it, no disrespect to them, but that wasn't really the qualifier. And I played in those games, but against the Iran in the two legs, I didn't come on in 97. Against the um, Uruguay in 2001, I, I only came on for five minutes in Montevideo. And, um, and I remember saying to myself after that, you know, I'm going to make sure that, you know, I'm playing at the highest possible level I can because I want to be involved. And then it started to go that uh, not only I'll, I'll score the winning goal and I, and I kept on mentioning it, to, you know, to my family and my wife, my brother, my parents. And it, it became that I would say that often that it just, I believed that I was going to score, the, you know, the goal that would take Australia to the World Cup. And I remember we uh, saying it to Martin Maduka one night we after a game in London. I can't remember if we'd played Jamaica in a friendly game. And uh, and I said, oh, Dukes, I'll score the winning goal. And and I'd forgotten about it, but um, he reminded me after uh, that goal, uh, that penalty, that, you know, what I said to him. So, you know, I'd said it that often that I'd actually believed it myself that it was going to happen. 
So and this is this is so important. The power of positive manifestation. Um, and uh, you, you you did probably push yourself to play at that highest possible level. And 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 going up. I um, obviously November sixteen two thousand five. I know I know that. Uh, remember like it was obviously yesterday you know um but the the uh, you gave a lot of joy uh to many australians a lot of relief to some count obviously it was brish's goal as well that sort of scuffle with uh <laughs> with with harry you know it sort of uh, scuffed the, the goal and he's come across and banged it what a great celebration but the uh, did you know which way you were going to put the ball uh, yeah. on that penalty, you always practice yeah. the five ones. You yeah, always the, put the same spot. Yeah, the, the the five penalties, I always put the same spot. Uh, oh, I did the night before because uh, you know, and and I remember Lucas Neil who stayed behind as well asked me why are you putting it all in the same corner. I said, well, I'm on the bench. If I come on, it's either you know you're going to be uh, for a penalty shootout. I said I only get one opportunity. Uh, I'm not changing my mind. You know, I, I know, uh, and so it was down that end. So I had sort of my run up marked up you know i was in line with the the post uh, on my right side at the 18 yard box and uh, and so i sort of knew my run up the steps that i was taking and then so that was sort of my conversation with myself you know yes. going up from the halfway line to the penalty spot it was like you know do exactly what you did yesterday mm -hmm. and we're going to the world cup and, yeah. it, and and it was sort of you know a walk a sort of floated to the penalty spot you know it, it wasn't um because I remember taking a penalty when I was 14 uh, for Adelaide City in the under-17, you know, uh, semi-final, and um, and I missed. You know, it was a fifth penalty, and I remember the walk from the halfway line. It was I was nervous. You know, my yes. legs felt like jelly. Well, this time round, it didn't. You know, because I prepared for it. I was ready Good. for it, and yeah. uh, and so that 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 helped a lot. And uh, so it's it's amazing. You know, the, the celebration. I think. Honestly, that's the fastest I've ever seen you run up. <laughs> like, you, you probably could have competed if that was a two hundred, right? You know that pace. You, you have to drop of these ones as well. You have to remember, I, I had an advantage. I didn't. I wasn't on for that long. I was on for about yeah. thirty odd minutes, and uh, <laughs> and so most of the other players had it played ninety in in Montevideo, yeah. one hundred and twenty here. Yeah, they were dead, and so yeah. they couldn't catch me. So yeah, I, I was quite right. lucky. Uh, that was quality and um, eruption, obviously. Um, and then, uh, obviously, we, we, we go on to the World Cup and then you get to come on again and, and score a goal in a World Cup. Not too many Australians get to say that. What was that feeling like? Uh, that, against the... that was just as good as the, the Uruguay feeling because, um, you know, we didn't want to just get to a World Cup. We wanted to show the world what we could do. We believed that we could actually... You know, really compete and, and and get through the group stage, and then you know who knows where it could have taken us. Um, so we were uh, we were confident that we could beat Japan, but we knew we needed to beat Japan because if we didn't beat Japan, that was it. Mm -hmm. Our World Cup was virtually done because we had Brazil the next game, Croatia the third game, who were very you know well respected. They were uh, a good European, uh, very good European side, you know. Um, so we, we thought that we had to beat Japan. So being 1-0 down for so long and then, um, you know, coming on when we were 1-0 down, Timmy ended up scoring those two goals and then to, to score that third, we knew that we'd won the game. Yeah, yeah. And and so that, that fueled to having, as a striker, you love scoring goals. You dream of scoring a goal in the World Cup and to do it and to be involved in Australia's first win at a World Cup is, you know, that was a highlight. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, hats off to you. So uh, we watched that. A game early in the morning, so uh, a lot, a lot of joy to a lot of Aussies. Um, happy days. So uh, the uh, with uh, with that World Cup uh, memories, what were the how how obviously that that loss? Um, how how much does that bite in? Because it's uh, an intelligent, I call it a, you know, whether it was a penalty or not a penalty, you know, it was in, an intelligent by, by, um, to, to go down, you know, the, the level of contact at that moment, yeah. um, you know, we all sort of felt cheated uh, as spectators, but when, when you're in the side, how, do, how does that go down? Yeah, it was tough um, because we, we also felt cheated. Deep down, we knew that the referee could give it. Because you know that that's uh, 
you know, they've been given. And uh, a lot of the times, you know that, that, you know, the Italians are quite smart. They're not only Italians, you know, uh, those European sides and South American sides with that experience, you know, they see someone on the floor, you know, they, they're going to make sure they get contact. And, and mm. you know, so he went down, did, you know, yeah, I didn't agree with it at the time, but, uh, you know, looking back, you understand how the referee could give it. But it, it hurt, you know, and it still does hurt because it yeah. felt like it was it was an opportunity lost um, mm. because they were down to 10 men. You know, we were 11. We would have gone to extra time. We felt really fit. Yeah, you would have overran them. We would have yeah. overran them. You know, I remember coming on with about, I can't remember if it was 15 minutes left or 10 minutes left, and... Um, and I remember being on the pitch and just looking into the opposition eyes and just seeing Gattuso, who's an animal, animal. Who run all yeah. day. He just looked defeated. He looked tired. And uh, and so I, I thought that we had him. And, mm. uh, and then to concede like that with, with no opportunity to come back because Totti, as soon as he kicked it, the final whistle, the game was over. So yeah. it, it, that hurt a lot. Yeah. So these are sort of the agony and the ecstasy of, uh, of football. The um, you uh, you return you return back uh, to uh, Australia and uh, with the Central Coast and uh, automatically get some silverware. Um, how was uh, how was your return to Australia? Was it good coming back to uh, to home soil? Yeah, it was good. It was different because you know it uh, I never experienced you know. Um, first of all, professional uh, football in Australia because we, we'd had only semi-professional before I left. And then to all of a sudden to come back to, you know, professional league was, was good and you, you're trying to help grow the game. Um, yeah, so, you know, it was nice to win the, the Premier's plate with Central Coast and then we got to the grand final against Newcastle, full stadium. Mm. Um, so it was it was good to, to be able to play in front of the, those big crowds again, you know. Um, ended up getting, uh, you know, going to Sydney FC for the for the next couple of seasons. Um, had a massive setback. It, it actually, it, it you know, it was unfortunate for me and for them that you know I had a bad knee injury that first season mm. and things didn't go well. And uh, but you know, there are things that you have to deal with and and then you know move on and and try and do as best as you can when you are able to play. Yeah, so the um, obviously you're there to do a job, but you know I, I think you, you you helped. You know, you you weren't there for the the, the, the last game of the year that Sydney um, championship winning uh, side, but I mean you, you contributed to that team and you were there as a figurehead. Obviously, um, you know players would have looked up to you in that dressing room uh, to to go and. Uh, Set the standard, let's call it, yeah. in, that, in that side. Um, and so I know that the the guys at Sydney look fondly upon your your efforts at that. Um, there. So what what do you take home from your time at Sydney FC? And um, look, the time was was tough at that the, the first year, and and I look at it as a positive that I, I me personally, but also as a team to turn it around in that second season because that second mm. season we ended up winning. You know the, the the premiers played and also the, the grand final. Yeah, I missed out on the the, the championship game because I injured myself. Uh, yeah. the, my my hamstring tore off the bone in the in the semi final against Wellington, yeah. so I missed out on the grand final. But um, and Steve Corica also missed out just before I think he got injured in the yeah. the game uh, that we beat Melbourne victory uh, to win the the premiers plate. So you know it was it was. I've got good memories of, you know, actually mm. being able to turn it around as a team and also individually to, to end up, you know, because we missed out on the, the finals this, the season before. Yeah. And then then after that, we were able to win it. And, you know, to be able to help, you know, and, and be there, you know, to not guide because they had talent like yeah. Alex Brosk and Mark yeah. Bridge and those sorts of players, you know, it was, was good because, uh, you know, I, I felt that, you know, I could help them understand what it takes to, to play at the top yeah. level. And uh, then uh, describe the contrast for obviously Sydney FC and then Melbourne Heart, my beloved Melbourne Heart. Um, that contrast would have been, couldn't probably be more dramatic. So the, the difference in uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the clubs, you obviously went on to, to coach as well, um, that side. But what was that like playing at uh, Melbourne Heart? 
and it was good. You know, I, I enjoyed my last season, um, you know, because I knew it was going to be my last season. So okay. uh, I'd already signed for, for Melbourne Heart when I uh, was finishing off with Sydney FC. And, and then I ended up getting injured, um, you know, just before the end of the season. So hamstring off the bone. I had a problem with my right knee. So I went in to, for surgery. I had to get my right knee cleaned up and my left hamstring fits <laughs> back on. So I come out and I can't walk. <laughs> so I didn't – they weren't expecting a lot from me, the Melbourne Heart, in terms of playing-wise because they thought, you know, I might not have been able to return at all to playing. Right. Um, and, you know, if I was able to, it was only going to be like 10, 15-minute cameos. But they were happy with that okay. because they wanted me to support the, the younger players. But once I ended up getting back fit, I ended up playing majority of games yes. and, and, and starting because, you know, it, I was obviously doing okay. But in terms of my body, I could hardly move anymore. Yeah, was, walking wounded. Yeah, was, <laughs> what was your load during the week? Uh, so how many sessions did you, did you do a full load or did they have the nurse? Yeah, I, I, that was the hardest thing to do. Like Even at Sydney FC, even a little bit at the Mariners, is when you start, your body starts to give up on you, is that you're not able to train every day. Um, mm. just trying to prepare for the game. Now, the, the best part about uh, being a footballer a lot of the time is that day in, day out stuff with, you know, your teammates and, you know, your competitive nature in training and, and you know, getting to know your teammates as well. So that was hard. I, I, I reckon I probably only trained twice a week, you know, uh, at the end of my career and uh, so it was a recovery after a game yes and then and then you know even day before games I wasn't even training which was you know unusual for me but uh, that's all I had to do or all I could do to get on the pitch yes and um, like I said uh, you went on to to coach uh, um, many sides in the in the um uh, so obviously both uh, Melbourne uh, and, and Brisbane. Um, and you had your brother. You had your brother at uh, uh, Brisbane uh, as well with you. What was that like having coaching aside with Ross in the team? Yeah, no, it was really good. Um, look, the first thing uh, why I wanted Ross was because he was a good coach. Um, that, that's the first thing that I had to look at. And, you know, I'd seen what he had done with uh, the Lady Reds uh, down in Adelaide, what he had done down at uh, NPL level in Adelaide with West Adelaide, and also what he was able to end up achieving, you know, being assistant coach to Stage uh, with the Matildas, you know, went to a World Cup. So, you know, that, that was the first thing, you know, is he going to be beneficial in terms of his coaching capabilities? Yes. So then after that, it was like, can I work with him? Um, you know, I, I can trust him. I know him inside yes. out. He knows me inside out. And and so, you know, we're, we're different, you know, characters as well. Um, and so sometimes you need to have someone different around you. You can't always have the same sort of person next to you because then, you know, you don't actually uh, compliment each other. It's this good cop, well. maybe for lack of a better word, good cop, bad cop or yeah. the different energy in the room. Yeah, right? just, just different energy in the room. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, I might want him to, to actually rev up the, the players because if I do it all the time, then it's my, my voice becomes stale. Mm. So it, it was, you know, it was actually... Uh, it worked really well with, um, you know, we were very unfortunate that we didn't win the, the Premier's play in the first season at Brisbane. We missed out by one point. We All we needed to do was win against Melbourne Victory, who had rested a lot of players in their last game against us down at Amy Park. And we had a number of chances, but we ended up drawing the all. So we missed out on, on winning that by one point. And then the major semi-final, we, we, uh, we were up... Uh, 3-0 against the Western Sydney Wanderers and, you know, we ended up uh, drawing 4 all in normal time and yeah. they beat us. Uh, Great game, but disaster for a coach, right? They're oh, coach yeah. killers. <laughs> it was a coach, coach killer. It oh, was a boy. Coach killer. But it was, you know, when you talk about the level and the, and the, the, the actual atmosphere at the game, that was probably the best atmosphere and best standard, you know, of football that, you know, that I can remember the A-League having. Um, mm. And uh, and that was it was great. It was, you know... It was a hard experience to go through losing, but it was a good experience because we, you know, I thought that the actual A-League that season was was at a very, very high level. You know, your beloved Melbourne City had a top side that year and I think they finished fourth, um, you know, had Fawn Rowley, had, um, you know, players like that, Moy and, and, and yeah. 
you know, a free scoring side, um, but you know, only could finish fourth. Uh, Sydney FC didn't even make the six that year with yeah. Graham Arnold, and you know, Melbourne Victory had came sixth, and you know, it was it was a really really good strong competition. The um, you, you know, you've now played and coached at the highest possible level, and what I the question I always ask is, if you had to give advice to that. that 13, 14, 15, 16 year old, um, what they, they need to um, learn or understand? I think the biggest thing is your work ethic. I, I think that, um, you know, there's plenty, and we spoke about it earlier, there's plenty of talented players, there's plenty of talented, you know, people in the world. Um, but, you know, the ones that go further, the ones that end up achieving is the, are the ones that, you know, work hard at their game and, and their craft and I, you know it's one thing about working hard it's also working smart you know mm. you have to find the right ways to do things and and learn from your mistakes and and, and try and improve all the time um and you know know you're going to have setbacks that's how you overcome those setbacks you know that, that's really important because you know i don't think any uh, successful person you know in life in general hasn't had a setback you know yeah. they, they just know how to get over it and and how to deal with obstacles and I think that's important it, you know you have to be able to you know especially now with the social media have thick skin as well yes. because um, you know a lot of people don't realize you know the amount that uh, you know especially people in the spotlight what they have to deal with um, so, you know, you can't worry about those things. You have to be so focused on what you yeah. are there to achieve and have people around you that uh, are there to help you as well. So it's interesting that you say that. So success is never a straight line, right? No. So it's, it's a squiggle, right? Yeah. The, uh, um, you, 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 see, you, you see somebody be successful, but you don't know what they've gone through to get where they are. And, and you talk about that time you were coaching uh, Brisbane and, you know, being centimeters away from um doing a job and but yeah we talk about those those coach killer moments that uh, um it, it off, you know you you've always had that and and um you've uh, recently uh, come across probably the the most difficult challenge of your life you're now middle-aged um how did the the mentality of being a professional footballer help you cope with the challenge of your health? Because I believe now health is the new wealth. And you had a recent, uh, recent difficulty with your heart. And yeah. So talk to me about how your professional and, and uh, managerial career, what did that, how did that lead up to the fact that now dealing with yeah. maybe your, your greatest challenge in your life? Would one, yeah, that, that was definitely the greatest challenge that I've had to deal with because, um, you know, even though I am middle-aged now, I'm going to be 45 next week, and, you know, you, you, I still felt physically that, uh, you know, good. I was in yeah. good condition and, 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 and in good health. But, um, you know, there, there was something not right that was I was feeling and, uh, you know, I, was, I could feel my heart... Um, you know, had sort of uh, heart palpitations when I was sitting down on the couch watching, you know, uh, football on TV. And I was, I was telling my wife and she said, just go get a checkup. And, and mm -hmm. I remember going to get the checkup and, um, you know, they sent me straight away to the cardiologist, ended up having a scan and, and they found that I had a tear in my mitral valve. And, you know, your first thought is, is why, what, what happened, you know? Is it, why me? Yeah, why is, me? Is, is it your lifestyle? What have you, you know, what's been happening? And I remember I was sitting there alone in, in the, you know, with the cardiologist and, um, and he just said, look, it's, it's major um, and you're going to need to have an operation. Mm. And, uh, and so all these thoughts go into your head. Okay. Um, what needs to be done? You know, uh, open heart surgery. So, you know, you, you, they, they explain to you that, uh, you know, they cut from up here all the way down, open you up, you know, put your heart uh, on a machine, deflate your lungs, put it on, on a machine. Um, and then they, they operate and then you, you they, they talk about the operation uh, you know do you need to get your mitral valve replaced if you do then you're on do you want a pig's one or a mechanical one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
So what a great choice. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, all right, give me the you've been giving me the options and they're very like pretty straightforward. Blunt, at all. Yeah. And uh, and it was like, all right, okay, the mechanical one, you'd need to be on uh, this uh, sort of uh, this rat blood poison. Thinners, rat, and they call yeah. it rat poison. That's right. They call it rat poison. And then and, and the pigs one, you don't know how long it's gonna last for. It could last 10, 15 years, then you have to have another operation. But um he said, but what we will try and do at first, the, the surgeon, what they'll try and do is actually repair, repair it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so they're all the things they explain to you. And then, but the thing that I didn't, and, I, and they, they couldn't give me an answer is why it happened. They said, you're just unlucky. Yeah. The rest of your heart's fine. Um, you're just being unfortunate. You know, it's like crossing the road, getting hit by a car. You just, yep. you just don't know why it happened, how it happened. Um, so, the hardest thing was is when, you know, I went in three days before the actual surgery into the hospital because they have to do other tests on you. And, um, you know, but the, the week leading up, because they he told me, I think it was on the Tuesday and then I was getting operated the, the following Thursday. The week leading up is like, all right, I've had all this information thrown at me. I know I need it done. I'm going to have it done. Um, you know, telling your family is hard because, you know, first of all, you're trying to be strong for your kids and, and for your yeah. wife. I broke down when I told my dad because of that's when you open up the most. Um, and then it was like, what do I need to do? Uh, so then I started to draw back my experiences as a, as a player, as a coach, you know, in terms of mentally getting myself prepared. And I remember, you know, the, the, the manifestations that you're talking about, the positive, you know, uh, manifestations and, and uh, you know, what that can do for you and, and, uh, and how that can help you. So I, I started to write down, on a, a piece of paper, what I would like to happen during the operation. You know, I want them to be able to repair my mitral valve. Um, I want the, the recovery to go well. And so I had these things written down and, you know, every morning and every night I'd read them, uh, read through them at least three times. And, um, and then I would also, I'd learned how to meditate while I was coaching as well to, to you know, really calm your body down and um, and so that helped me because you know you don't know going into this major surgery how you're going to come out if you're going to come out of it and and that plays on your mind a little bit so every time I actually was thinking neg- negatively about it yeah. I'll go and read these you know things that I'd written down I would uh, you know I'll try and meditate I'd, I'd read a book the monk who sold his Ferrari um, which I was during, I was reading that during that period as well that kept wow. me you know it, it was. Yeah. I tried everything possible to keep my mind turning into a negative way and just yeah. trying to keep it positive the whole time. Fantastic. And, and so through every sort of dark moment, I think that's, that's where people get the greatest growth. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so maybe we can finish off, you know, uh, what has been your revelation since that moment? What, what, where's been the growth? What, what next? What's the positive that you can draw out of this? Um, that maybe that new lease of life or the, the new refound passion, what it is, what's next for John Ellis? You, you know, when I was sitting there in, in hospital uh, recovering and um, I realised that my passion's football. Mm. It, it, it's, uh, it, that, that's my passion. And, and, and at the moment, it's not playing anymore. It's, it's coaching. And so I know I'll get back into it and I, and I will coach again because I felt you know, that drive for it even more so when I'm sitting there, you know, obviously I needed my body to recover from the operation, which now physically I'm, you know, all in good health and, and feel strong and healthy. Um, you know, also, you know, your family, I've always appreciated my family, but you appreciate them even more. Uh, so it doubles down now. It doubles yeah. Down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's uh, I've been able to spend, you know, it's never nice, you know, not doing something that you love, but, you know, I look at it the other side that I've been able to spend really quality time with, you know, my family, because when you're coaching, it, believe me, it's 24 seven, you know, sometimes you might be sitting there with your family, but there's things going on in your head that's, you know, you're thinking about the, you know, I need to tell this player this, I need to, this, yeah. you know, is in my mind or whatever it is. So, you know, I will never get these years back with my girls. I've got three daughters. So I've I've tried to make the most of that, you know, and, um, and, you know, hopefully soon I'll I'll start coaching again. Oh, fantastic. So um, John Aloisi, you have 
played at the highest possible level. Uh, firstly, congratulations and uh, thank you for your contribution to Australian football. It was um, that one uh, spot kick uh, that, uh, you know, released a pressure valve um, that, uh, like I said, turned uh, many tears uh, of sadness into uh, elations of joy. Um, so, I wish you all the very best in your next endeavours and um, it's been a great honour and a privilege. No, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully the audience enjoys it as well. Hey, guys. We've come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our wonderful guest. If you like this type of content and would like to see more, how about you hit the like and subscribe button? and have a fantastic day.